So I'm Jacob. I've been a GNU Radio user for uh, a while, since 2007 or so. Um, first time talking here, so I'm really excited. It's good. I've benefited from a lot of the work that everyone here has done. And uh, I'm with Sandia National Laboratories out of Albuquerque. We're a conference sponsor. We're also happy to, to be doing that this year. Um, and we're really happy to get some of the code that we've built back to the open source. It's not always super easy for us. Um, there are a lot of government processes to do that, but I think we finally figured it out. And as of yesterday, this is all on our official GitHub page. So you can go download it. That's awesome. It's a lot of work. Um, and hopefully it's useful to you. The, uh, I'm going to talk through some extensions that we built into the PDU uh, concept within GNU Radio. So this takes advantage of the asynchronous message passing interface. And um, just in case anybody isn't familiar, this talk will be fairly useless without understanding that. So you have the regular streaming way of doing things. I'll say regular. It's probably the most common. Um, and then you have the asynchronous message passing or PDU passing interface here. So it, ultimately, the difference is that there's no back pressure, but you're still moving data through, through the flow graph. Um, in this case, the PDUs are going to be polymorphic type pairs of a dictionary of metadata that you could change and a standard, a uniform vector of some sort of data. And what we're kind of presenting here and what we've made available is some interfaces to convert between the streaming API and PDUs, which don't necessarily exist um, in tree. So a, a little bit about the motivation for doing this. Um, the reason we started building these tools out was because we had a, uh, we were given a, a challenge here, which doesn't sound very hard at all, and conceptually it's very simple, but receive a burst of information from a software-defined radio or, or wherever, uh, and receive that, process it, and transmit another burst of information on the same or some other frequency. Um, if it's not all together in uh, you know, a common way, the same modulation type, the same, uh, the same symbol rate that you expect, things like that, things break down pretty quickly. And once you start factoring in real world constraints of radios where you have turnaround time requirements or uh, TDMA constraints where you have a time slot that is available to you to transmit energy back in, things get complicated very, very, very quickly. And then you throw in frequency hopping or the, the need to switch frequency bands arbitrarily or change modulation coding schemes. Um, it gets complicated pretty quick. I think of those things, latency tends to be a huge sticking point for people. And I, in my experience, it's one of the reasons when we go talk to people about using GNU Radio, uh, they'll say, oh, no, you can't use GNU Radio. There's way too much latency. So we use something else entirely. And these are some examples. There are a whole, uh, whole bunch of other, other options, but GNU Radio is really, really good, and we wanted to build some tools that would help us continue to keep our capability within GNU Radio. Um, when it comes to latency, we, we tend to say we're low latency, but that doesn't really mean anything because everyone's version of latency is different. We were having this conversation last night. Uh, what is low latency? Is, is low latency being able to do something within a second, within uh, a millisecond, within a microsecond. And so when we say low latency, we're kind of talking about the, the millisecond accurate or millisecond turnaround time. Um, this may or may not be low latency to you. If you're building an 802.11 Phi, it's definitely not low latency. If you're doing voice comms, then this is way faster than you should need. Um, there, are some, there are some current tools that exist, and I'll walk through those quickly, but they had, uh, all of them had limitations for, for what we were trying to do, um, which was, so back to the, you know, what, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to convert bursts of energy into chunks of data we can process and uh, be able to understand where in time, where in frequency that came from. And then on the other side, on the transmit side, turn that around and with, we call it sample accurate transmission time. So uh, depending on how fast your sample rate is, I'd like to be able to put that energy over the air at a time and a frequency of, of my choosing um, with reasonable accuracy. 
portable, so nothing super specialized. We didn't want to build up a whole bunch of FPGA code to do this. We wanted to keep it all, all in software that we can build and target at any of these embedded processing platforms, laptops, whatever. Um, robust, so keeping track of time. When we're talking about latency and timing, uh, you have to be able to handle sit, uh, drop data. Um, there, there's really no, no value to us in a tool that's going to slew over time and, and require to be reset. So there's a lot of work that went into keeping accurate track of time. Um, and then efficient. You know, we didn't want to develop a, a, clunky, a clunky tool that was going to take up a ton, of, a ton of processing power and require a server to run. So let's talk through the existing tool set prior to this that we, that we went through. Um, there are some entry tools available. And a lot of people get horribly misguided into this. Uh, this question gets asked all the time, and inevitably the answer is, oh, use the tag, use tags, uh, use tag streams. Don't use tag streams. They're, they're really bad. Um, here is, <laughs> so, so if this isn't a selling point for tag streams, I don't know what is. Um, bugs, inefficiencies, grief, undocumented contracts. Um, they're bad, don't use them. I think they might be going away. I'm not entirely sure. Somebody in this room surely knows, um, but hopefully they do. The other, um, the other thing that gets brought up a lot, I'll say, is the GRUHD stream tags. So this is a way of providing receive time tracking and information, metadata as stream tags. Um, all of the, the UHD devices, or all of the Edis devices support this on the receive side. And there are similar constructs on the transmit side where you can tag what, you know, the start of a burst, the end of a burst, and what frequency you want energy to go out at. Um, this, this is really, really useful, but it's not a complete solution to do everything we wanted to do. Um, our, our code that we're providing does make extensive use of this style of stream tag, um, and we've extended it to other uh, hardware that we use. For example, the, the Sidekick hardware, adding the ability to use this type of time tag um, is, is really helpful when you want to keep sample plus or minus accurate uh, track of time. There's also an extensive packet communications API. Um, this is, a, this is a, powerful, a powerful scheme, in it, but it does make use of these tag stream blocks in a couple places, and ultimately we were never able to make this run fast enough. Transmit to receive latency, we were ne uh, never able to get it uh, low enough. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but we, were, we weren't able to get this below 10, maybe 5 millisecond turnaround time. Um, I think it's a, a reasonable option if you're doing things yourself and you can build around some of the limitations that we experienced or you understand it better than we did, but we found the, the PDU utility module that we built uh, significantly easier to, to use. Um, there's a couple of links there. The Doxygen's pretty good and um, the GRUAS link is uh, an interesting module that makes use of that for kind of custom communication projects. And then there's event stream. So event stream does provide closed loop timing by interleaving information, interleaving bursts of data into a, a steady transmit stream. Um, GR event stream works really, really well. However, it relies on typical back pressure. So if you have a lot of blocks, you can end up getting, having a, uh, if you have a lot of blocks between your event stream source and your software-defined radio sync, you can end up with a significant amount of data in flight between when you're able to in insert data and when it goes out over the air, which sets your minimum latency. Um, this was really the limiting factor here, but there are a lot of really good concepts within event stream that I think we'll probably consider using moving forward. Um, the other thing that EventStream does uh, is, I don't know where Tim is, but some of, these, some of the things that look like normal messages uh, are not normal messages, and they cause blocks like the ZMQ message sync and source to, to freak out. Um, so ultimately, we didn't make too much use of, of GR EventStream in the module that we're presenting here. So we'll go into what, what is the GRPDU utils module. Um, this is kind of the general flow for, for how, how this module is intended to be used. Um, ultimately, what you're getting here is a, a set of tools for converting between the streaming and the asynchronous message APIs within GNU Radio. So the idea is that you have data, 
you tag it with stream tags and you say, this is the start of something interesting, this is the end of something interesting, and there are tools that will convert that to, uh, to PDUs and send them out. Um, timing information is preserved as metadata in the PDU dictionary that we, had, uh, we mentioned earlier. Um, so that, that is nice because you can keep track of that as you move forward, and if you do something in the PDU processing stage where you change rates or you resample something or you convert data types, you can simply propagate more information or modify timing information within that, that metadata dictionary. And then eventually if you want to transmit something, you may choose to convert that to a, back into a stream. There are tools to do that. And uh, that timing information can again be used to append those TXSOB, TXEOB, and TXTime tags. And there's a little bit more information on that. And ultimately, if you're using a, a software-defined radio that is capable of adjusting that information for transmission, you should get energy out at that point in time. So time management is done with tags. Um, the, the TX time tag key will be appended by that PDU to stream block, and um, UHD style time tuples are used on the, uh, on the receive path. The, this talk is titled GRPDU Utils. There's actually four modules that we published open source. Uh, one of the other ones is this timing utilities module. This is very related to PDU Utils. Um, some of the complexity is now OBE up until a couple years ago when Andy Walls finally fixed tag propagation within the symbol synchronizer block, which uh, there was a bunch of a bunch of overhead on top of this where we would add a bunch of tags and see where they end up knowing where they were on the input stream and then track on the output stream to keep that approximately sample level uh, accuracy on timing. A lot of that complexity is OBE, so this doesn't really need to be a separate module, but uh, I recommend installing it. It's pretty small and it, it provides a lot of time to help, or it provides a lot of functionality to help keep track of time. The, there, are, there are UHD style time keys or time tags, which are a combination of a, a integer, an unsigned integer and a double to keep track of time and prevent round off from, from eventually causing havoc. There's a second type of, uh, of time tag that is used within this module here that also adds in the sample offset and sample rate. So if you end up using this, just keep that in mind. So how do you uh, put this together to extend this kind of basic FSK receiver example? So this is a pretty, pretty common way of, of doing streaming demodulation. You'll, you know, channel filter, FM demodulation, symbol recovery, clock recovery, slice the data. Um, really all that you're going to want to do to take that information and get it into a PDU is uh, identify where the start of a burst is. In this case, the correlate access code tag block will use a, you know, a, a start of frame delimiter uh, or the end of your preamble to do that. And then at that point, uh, there are a couple of options. You can either configure the tags to PDU block to have a maximum amount of data and it will just accumulate data and then spit it back out. Or you can end of burst tag or do some sort of, some sort of real time decoding of the, the uh, length information if it's present in whatever you're looking at. The, uh, ultimately, putting that end of burst tag, you'll know exactly what you're getting in that PDU, but you don't have to do that. And at that point, you have one of these, these PDUs where you've got some timing information, you've got a unique ID number you can key off of, you have, um, and then you have the, the uniform vector of the actual data that you pulled off of the, the slicer. And so how that, how that works inside of a full TDMA uh, transceiver would look something like this. So you can take that top concept um, and then on the transmit side, you might have a block that's going to do some sort of preamble adding. Uh, that's, that's provided within this module. 
you might want to modulate that data. In this case, there is a GM, uh, GMSK modulator that's built into this as well. Um, and then you can convert that back to streaming for transmission, or if you have a, uh, a block that can ingest this PDU uh, as is, you don't really even need that step. To, to be compatible with all of the USERP hardware out there, it's pretty convenient to just convert it back to streaming. But the nice thing is, in the middle of this receiver side and transmitter side, you have a super convenient place where you're passing around a really well-structured chunk of data that has all of the information content of your message. So you can take this, you can send it out over a network. If you use the ZMQ message source, you can put that over to some sort of higher layer processor. And now you have the ability to make you know, decisions based on that information and formulate a new response. Um, you can also choose wherever you want to emit this in frequency using, um, using the frequency uh, metadata field and the PDU to stream block will, will take care of that for you as well. So I mentioned this earlier, and this was low latency sort of was the, the reason that none of the entry or existing capabilities that we came across worked very well for, for our application. Um, but what, is, what, what does low latency mean that's subjective? And, and what are the causes of latency within, within GNU Radio? I think primarily I see things that posts that end up ultimately blaming something related to the runtime. Um, it's not really the runtime that causes latency within GNU Radio. What it primarily is, is this concept of accumulating data and buffers and then passing it along. Uh, the largest buffer size in your flow graph is going to set your minimum latency. If, the, if the, the start of whatever energy that you received is in the very beginning of your buffer, you have to wait until all of that other data accumulates before you can move it along. Um, things that are not transparent to, or that are completely, I'm sorry, that are not obvious to a user, like transport control buffering and things like that can cause huge sources of latency. If your SCR hardware is accumulating a ton of data before it ever provides it to the host, you're already sunk in terms of, of getting latency beyond, or getting TR turnaround better than that. Um, to solve that, you can reduce data buffer sizes. That's the best. You can also increase sample rate. That means there's less time in that buffer of data. and uh, that will, that will help reduce your latency, but it's always a trade-off. Smaller buffers, if you're processing one sample at a time, the smallest buffer, you have a lot of overhead with regard to calling that, and it, it, it's going to increase your, your CPU utilization. So within the PDU uh, utils block, there's a tool to characterize round-trip latency. So we built a flow graph that will work with the PDU utils module and UHD hardware and it will actually characterize round trip latency. And so what the flow graph's a little bit confusing, so here's a decoder for it. What you get out of that is you basically generate a periodic signal that tells the flow graph to emit a PDU message for transmission, and then you correlate when that happened relative to when it comes back around and you receive it. So you need to just loop back your SDR or terminate it and, and you'll get internal leakage. Um, when you do that with the default UHD arguments, and this was done on a user B210, I think, you end up getting about two millisecond round trip latency, which is actually really, really good. However, if you tune some of the uh, transport parameters, which uh, can be passed as an argument to the, the user source block, uh, you can actually get this down really, really low. So it's a statistical problem, and ultimately some, some process on your computer will end up causing some sort of delay and a, a block getting called and you'll get latency, but you can see the histograms there of, that were measured with these low, lower latency UHD arguments and you can turn that energy around in about 270 microseconds nominally. Um, it, will, it will inevitably take longer sometimes, but you can see the, the gray part, the gray histogram there is with the default arguments and it, it's a little bit ugly, but once you tune down those, those late, the, the transport control arguments, you can, you can turn around information very, very quickly. So a couple notable blocks that are included in this, there are, uh, I, won't, I won't read all of these off, it's mostly included just uh, as, as a reference, but there are uh, a whole bunch of 
of really, really useful capabilities beyond just the, the stream conversion blocks. Um, we talked about that pretty well, but in addition, there are some other kind of useful, interesting things you can start doing once you adopt this methodology. So there's this tag message trigger block, which allows you, based on certain streaming conditions, to emit a message. And this is really helpful if you want to send like an acknowledgement whenever you get a certain type of energy. You can, uh, this, this block can do that based on tag keys. Um, you can provide an arming condition before that block will actually trigger. There, there are a whole bunch of things you can do there, and it can emit fixed messages or time PDUs. So if you want to reply exactly 2.000 milliseconds after uh, you, rec you receive energy of some of a specified format or whatever, uh, you can use this block to change the transmit time accordingly, and, and it will very, very reliably, within a few microseconds, emit that message at that time. There are data converter blocks. so. That the first PDU I showed was a bunch of ones and zeros represented as a bit per byte. There are blocks to convert that into, you know, to stuff those bits into bytes. There is a really cool block. So uh, Michael Osman over here put together a really good talk on whole packet clock recovery, and so uh, we implemented that as uh, as a as a block within the PDU utilities and. It's really interesting because you don't need to know too much about the symbol rate of, of information, and it will, it will attempt to, uh, using that algorithm, it will attempt to determine what the clock rate is. It will append that as a metadata tag into your dictionary, and it will provide you out soft symbols. And I have a little demonstration that I'll do in a minute on that. Um, there's also some kind of strange blocks like this flow controller. Uh, basically, this block checks buffer sizes, uh, checks how many PDU messages have been accumulated in the input queues for these blocks, and will actually start dropping them if they get too full. It's kind of dangerous. Um, maybe don't use it, but it is there. <laughs> um, so real quick, I'll just talk through a couple other modules that are included in this. Um, there's, I talked about PDU utils, there's the timing utils, and then there's this other module, FHSS utils. So we built this, this module to uh, receive energy from a frequency hopping transmitter that was sitting in an ISM band. Um, this was derived from GR Iridium. So I don't know if anyone who worked on or built GR Iridium is here, but if you want to receive Iridium information, you have a similar problem that we did receiving hopping data that you don't know what frequency it's at. Uh, Iridium is a, a satellite system, a, a data satellite system, and while it is channelized, and you could say, I'm going to look at channel, you know, 47, uh, and there's a frequency associated with it, the, the Iridium constellation, the Doppler spread, is wider than the channel width, so you effectively have a similar problem where you need to be able to receive energy from anywhere in the entire 10 or so megahertz that Iridium exists. So, uh, to do that, they built this FFT-based energy detector, and what that does is whenever it sees energy, it puts a tag into the sample stream, so you get timing information, and that tag contains frequency information as well. Uh, the downstream blocks kind of segment that out. They time slice them, and then they frequency, uh, they, they recenter and decimate the burst significantly. So this is very convenient in a general sense, so we sort of retooled this into just two blocks here where you tag energy, and so the input there is a, a sample stream, and the output is a tagged sample stream, and then this tagged burst PDU block is gonna take all of those and emit them as individual, individual uh, PDU messages. So what that looks like, here's kind of a, a real world, very clean ISM band recording and what you get out of that, if you run that through the F8, those two FHSS utils blocks, is you get a bunch of detections that end up highlighted there. And as an output of those, you end up with, uh, with the, the uniform vector representing the raw data of that, of that sample. Um, what you also get that's really cool is you can start making measurements about that and append those as metadata in that dictionary. So in this case, you have things like symbol rate estimate, which the whole packet clock recovery block gave you. Uh, you have, these are kind of small, um, noise information about the, the FFT bin that that was detected from, as well as magnitude information on the signal. These are unit lists, but 
useful in a relative sense. Bandwidth information, uh, it's kind of cool. And you can start making additional measurements on this and uh, kind of get a good sense without knowing almost anything about what, what's out in the ISM band. You can get a sense for what's there. So uh, it's not perfect, but it does work pretty well down to about 6 dB signal to noise ratio for, for data uh, out there. Um, if you do use this for, for long signals or very short signals, you'll need to tune it. It does a lot of work to kick out false detections, um, and primarily it does that based on time. If it gets very, very, very short detections, which it does all the time, it will, it will not emit those to prevent you from getting totally swamped with data. And then this other module that we published, we talked about should we publish this or not. This Sandia Utilities is our dumping ground, but it does contain a lot of even uh, a lot of pre-release stuff before we're able to upstream them, especially with uh, with 3.7 not getting any feature changes. When we want to add little little stuff to blocks that we find are generally useful, we'll store them here. Um, and it also contains really other really, really dangerous blocks like this block buffer thing. Uh, the intention of this block buffer is to do whatever it can to provide you continuous chunks of data. So. Uh, say you have a processor that can't come anywhere close to keeping up with your, use, your UHD data stream, it will do whatever it can to provide you only continuous chunks of data. It sounds very simple, but it ends up with all sorts of absolutely horrendous side effects and edge cases. Um, so if you're using our, our GR toolkit, I recommend you install this one as well. Um, this, isn't, this isn't out yet. I apologize. I mentioned that we extended some of these time tag features for the sidekick radios. Um, this is something we will get out there soon-ish where we're working with Epic to figure out the right way to make this live. I call this yet another GR sidekick. Uh, there are at least five of you in this room who've built your own GR sidekick. Um, that's okay. <laughs> we built our own too, but uh, we will try to make this out there. It does have uh, DDCs and DUCs in the FPGA. Um, there, are, there are command queues and time tag support is really, really helpful if you're trying to do any transmission. So uh, some things I kind of takeaways: PMTs are, are underutilized. They really are. There's a, a ton of stuff you can do with them, and they're very powerful. Um, you just have to deal with a small amount of frustrating PMT behavior. Um, this, is how, uh, this is how Edis handles uh, command information into the, the UHD blocks. The PMT dictionaries, this is just an example of the frustrating stuff you have to deal with sometimes. Um, PMT pairs and dictionaries both pass the test for each other because dictionaries are composed of pairs. Um, however, they process differently, so you have to do some kind of weird stuff to figure it out. Um, the, this module, I hope, helps bridge the PDU uh, and streaming APIs and, and methods of, of doing this. Um, there are straightforward tools that are available out there now for developing bursty transceivers frequency opping transceivers in, in kind of a different way than we've seen done so far. Um, and you can, you can do low latency uh, systems within GNU radio. Uh, you do not need to do this all in, in C++ or something. Um, I kind of hope that some of these tools are, are useful enough that we talk about pulling them into GNU radio. Certainly some of the basic, uh, like, PDU data manipulation, just like, counting, a block to count PDUs, for example. This type of thing is pretty useful in general, and I'd like to see them pulled into GNU Radio at some point. So thanks. Thanks for your time. Um, this is a picture of our GitHub as of yesterday afternoon. So go, go download these if this would be useful to you, um, and, and let us know if, if they're helpful. Uh, I will do a couple things real quick, since I think I have a few minutes. Uh, so. I will attempt to run this, one of the examples that's included with the frequency hopping utils module is this arbitrary sort of energy detector. Um, I'll run this over the air. I have a user here on my laptop. I don't know if it'll actually pick much up. So this is tuned to the 900 ISM band. That's about 30 megahertz wide, um, that input spectrogram. And uh, there's not a lot going on here. This is probably like, capture the flag spoilers or something, I don't know. But uh, 
anyhow, uh, at least they're spoiled for everybody. <laughs> so um, this, I will say, this does not look like it is uh, any sort of like FSK signal or something. This FM demodulation window here is showing kind of, I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, that's even more spoilers, isn't it? Uh, what I can do, though, is I have a data recording that will be a little bit more interesting. So here's one that actually has, this is what the ISM band looks like a lot more frequently. And so what you're seeing there is, you know, uh, the input spectrogram, it's kind of hard to see up there, but there are little bursts of data all over the place. Let's see if I can make it so that it is more obvious for you guys. There, that looks better. So you see all these little things hopping around? I don't know. Uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these look very similar, so they're probably from the same, the same family of, of radios. But what you're seeing there is completely uninformed, uh, just quadrature demodulation and the FM demodulation window there in the middle. And then that soft symbol output is the result of the whole packet clock recovery. And when you see them very nicely aligned like that, you can tell that it is actually, you know, it is actually doing symbol alignment. And what's really cool, if, uh, so what you can see here down in the window, and I don't know if you guys can read all of this, but I was talking about all that metadata and what you're seeing there in, uh, sort of real time is all of that information popping out. So you're getting center frequency information, duration information, time information, power, uh, and then symbol rate. So a lot of these are like 165 kilo symbols per second. Um, this is cool because I didn't know that. I don't know what's in this file. Um, it was recorded from somewhere and you're able to pull that out completely uninformed. So. Anyhow, uh, give these tools a try. They're kind of interesting. I have one other demo I can do that I'll show you what that latency test looks like. And so this, this flow graph is included in the, in the FHSS utils example file. And then here is that latency determining flow graph. Ah, one second. I'll run it first with the default UHD arguments. Uh, the, the default transport control which I don't know what it is, somebody does. And so, what you can see here is the scale on the bottom is in microseconds. This, uh, this start window here is at five, uh, five microseconds and my cursor over here is at, I'm sorry, five milliseconds. My cursor right here is about 10 milliseconds. So what you're seeing there is uh, that uh, packet buffer delay. So the reason it's cycling like that is sometimes that burst is right at the very end of a block of data, in which case you can respond to it very, very quickly. And sometimes that burst is at the beginning of a block of data. So somewhere in there, there's buffering that's adding up to two or three milliseconds of, of, of data. And you can kind of see that, see that running through. Um, this flow graph, if you're interested, amongst, so this isn't built with Lib blog for CPP, so I'm getting all these debug messages, but you know it's printing out the the uh, the latency in milliseconds. But what's cool if we use a different value for the receive frame size and the send frame size, you can use this to figure out what that impact is. And without changing anything other than that value. Now you're looking at, so my cursor is at six milliseconds here, and it starts at five. So now you're looking at like 200 to 500 microseconds of turnaround time. Um, there's, a, there's one of these for the Sidekick tool too, if, if that's of interest to you. But um, yeah, if you want to talk, talk about any of this, let me know. Or if you want to see the demo, I'll, I'll have it with me. Uh, that's what I got. Thank you very much, Jacob. Okay. All right, uh, do we have any questions for Jacob? Kyle. Hey there. Um, thanks, I think this is actually really awesome. Um, I'm sure a lot of companies like, I mean, we've definitely built utilities that have done burst processing 
on the back end via ZMQ or something else, right? A lot of companies have had to do that. So this will actually be really useful. Um, my question was about the um, the buffer detect or the the block buffer. Um, yes. <laughs> one. So does that detect like upstream discontinuities like in the signal, and then it tries to build like a one megabyte or like a huge block of data that's continuous, that's how it works? Pretty much. Um, it, it doesn't do any sort of like data aid detection. It uses tags. It relies on something having knowledge of dropping data, um, and, and it uses tags to do that. Will it detect like the UHD OU kind of interface? Um, so OU is printed out by the logging part of libuhd, I think. But what it will detect is the source block puts a tag when there is a discontinuity. Um, Frustratingly, sometimes that tag is after the discontinuity, so you're sort of limited to what your hardware will allow you to do. But there's a similar construct within uh, lib sidekick that it will detect, that those blocks will detect it, but it's basically doing tag-based uh, detection of, of drop data. Cool. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, okay, I think we have several now. All right, I think we might take just one or two more and then Go to break. Where'd the hand come from? Nice and quick. Are you going to port it to GR38? <coughs> <laughs> Wrap it up, Ben. <laughs> yeah, we will eventually. So the truth is, like, we have a lot of work. Oh, we're hiring. Did I say that the other day? Yeah, like everybody else. Um, we're really busy. We'd really like to. The, the, the honest truth is I attempted to build 3.8 from Pi Bombs like a month ago, and it didn't build the first time, so I was like, I'll just come back to this later. <laughs> and we will. Um, where is Ryan? Are you here, Ryan? Ryan told me, so Ryan works for another DOE lab. Uh, he told me that he uh, got some of it working in 3.8. You could talk to, talk to the guy with his hand up over there. <laughs> All right. I know there are a few other questions, but I think we're going to have to end it. So I, I really want to thank Jacob. This is a significant, and everyone who contributed from Sandia. This is a really significant release of tools that I think are badly needed. I so, hope it's helpful. Yeah. Um, if you want to, so if you do want to talk to me about this, anyone, feel free to, to come up. Um, also, if you are with the government and you're curious about how I went through my process, maybe it's helpful to you, maybe it's not. Uh, especially if you're DOE government, I can possibly help with that too. But it's worth getting code out there. I feel bad. This, I feel bad not having this out two years ago when a lot of it was written. Right? Like, it just is a lot of energy sometimes. So. Yeah. So, I, round of applause for Jacob for his talk and for getting Thanks. this code out. Yeah.